Why do we have to have crows? Oh, you're good. I found it. Okay. Now, what do you want me to do? Search for our type URL. You want to you wanna look for the, the, your email at Yahoo and find the link. You can use email. you can use Chrome to do that. It's yahoo.com. I thought you okay. They got Facebook, they got uh so you want me to type in the URL? It's in an email message. So you just click on the link that I sent to you. Email message. Find your email in using Chrome. Okay. Here, here. Oh, I don't need you. Uh, you want to go back to Yahoo, right? Well, you want to use Chrome to find Yahoo. So on the address line at the top of the window, type in yahoo.com. the window, okay, hold on. I have Crow right next to Yahoo. So, play it one more time. Um, you have Chrome next to Yahoo? Yes, I do. Okay, well, look at your Yahoo email then. Okay, I have it on now. And do you see my recent message? I just sent one to you. Okay, I'll have to get out of, I'll get out, get on Yahoo. Okay. Okay, I need a, a sharing. Okay, Yahoo. Okay, I have the link back up. What do you want me to do, Sharon? Well, you click on the link. Okay. Did I go to Crow? Is that right? I already, okay, now I already did that. I already had it up once already. Okay. That's it out. Well, how do I do the Crow? Okay, where's the link opening? Is I already it... did it. I opened it up. In what? And the pictures came up. Doesn't say. I don't see the crow. Yeah, I can't tell what you're oh. looking at. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Do that. All I can say is <laughs> we'll have to get together and I'll show you how to use it over here. Well, you have to show me the record that, that I'd like to see it. Well, you, right. you can try it. Try. Um, you know, usually it's me who's providing tech support to folks. It's always entertaining when I see somebody else doing it for a change. Yeah, I don't know how to connect. Okay, I'll just do Okay, you could send me the link. Well, I'm a Google. Shoot. I have Google. Well, that's Chrome. Okay. So, uh, how do you do with the, the link? Can you type it in? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, the, the... Okay. I'll type it in. So, can you tell me the word? You've got it in your email. Well, see, I'm on Google now, but if I go out of Google, I'll be... You Yahoo. don't have to go out of Google. Doesn't yeah. it have the address bar at the top where you type where you want to go? No, I have a new tab and a, and a new tab. Well, the each tab is a, a separate window. Try one of the tabs. Okay, wait a minute. I got it right here. Deadline, walkie dead. Uh, okay. Uh, share activity. How do 
Hattiesville Kennedy. What are you looking for? Well, you told me to get the link, and that's what I'm trying to do. Oh, my, it's K-E-N-N-E-D-Y. Get out. -E -N -E -Y? Oh, oh, I got it. I had to interview you. Okay, now I'm on Google. Okay. Yeah, the Republican Party. Uh, Justice. <laughs> a lot of Kennedy. A lot of Sharon Kennedy. Uh, that's about it. What's your middle initial? Uh, it's Sharon, middle initial G, Kennedy. Maybe that will work. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, John. Sam asked me to kick off the meeting tonight since she may not be here on time. I would remind everyone to check your microphone, make sure you're on mute when you wish not to be heard. Do we have Joe online? Joe, if you're online, unmute, please. I don't see it, Joe. Yeah, neither do I. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Hi Nikki. Hello. <laughs> <clears throat> Did everyone get a chance to watch the uh, uh, webcast for MAPV? I watched the second one. Watched Christy Odom's. Yeah, they both were great. Both were really good presentations. Enjoyable. Weren't they going to send out links so we could watch that? Um, okay. Sam did post them uh, on the, the, the Facebook group, group page, Loud Photo Club. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure hey. I actually got the link personally, but she does have them posted out there. Just a, uh, I think on Sunday she posted it. Quite a bunch. I did ask everyone to go on mute, but we got a couple minutes here while we're waiting for other folks to join in. Okay.
quiet group tonight. Yeah, yeah everyone's on, most of us are on mute. <laughs> What's happened with you, Katie? Um, same old, same old. Are you still hobbling or are you hobbling less? Um, it depends on the day and whether I just worked a shift or not. It's, it's getting there. All right, we're good. It's getting there. Good. Not as quickly as I would like. Well, of course not. <laughs> I'm going to be on mute for just a moment. Got a priority phone call. Stand by just one for me. Hello, scattered. Where'd she go? I'm hiding. Did you guys say Julie has a question? I can't stay on very long because there's a French horn lesson in the background. <laughs> You'll hear it. To the basement. It's uh, too cold to sit outside for these meetings. Yes. But Julie has a question in uh, the chat about uh, enlarging brushes. Oh. I don't know the answer for her. Did it pop up? What's your question? It says, when I enlarge my brush, I have to click the caps lock. It seems that now that I have to click the caps lock to unlock the bracket every single time really takes forever to enlarge or make the brush smaller. Uh, she's not had to do that before. What is she missing? I don't think the caps locks is the right key. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had to do that, but I don't Probably know. Probably the shift. Mm -hmm. that again? Well, hello, Jeff. Hi. So I took a little excursion today, oh, played, a, played a little bit of hooky from work and went out to the brand new U.S. Army National Museum of the U.S. Army today. Oh, wow. Where is that? That's oh, uh, Fort Belvoir. Oh. Uh, not, right. on, not on the part of the base where you got to go through the gates. It's actually uh, ju just west of, or yeah, west of Telegraph Road on the Fairfax County Parkway. Yeah. You turn north into there and yeah, brand new building. Smells brand new. Was it timed entry or? Yeah, you go online and get tickets. I think the tickets are free, but yeah, they, you, they give you tickets for timed. Hmm. New, new well, exciting well, museum, $430 million. Yeah, it's well, pretty well done. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to check that out. And can you bring your camera in there? Yes. Do not plan to bring any kind of monopods or tripods. Pretty much just like the um, yeah, no. Air and Space Museum, for example. No flash photography allowed. Yeah, no flash. And you, there is a metal detector um, security check. Oh, God, I'd fail that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a good reason for that one. Yep. Where does he go? Whoops. <laughs> so we've got a few people trickling in. Anybody else take any recent excursions? No, work. Went to Office Depot. Ooh. Went to Sudbury, Pennsylvania. We met my brother-in-law halfway and he was further north. Sat there in the, uh, sit, the, sit, the little small town had a center park with the, uh, memorials. And we found a Cuban place and ate lunch together and socially distanced on a bench, all four corners. And uh, my wife and me, and then uh, we went back home after two hours. That was my field trip Thursday. Hey, it's getting out of the house. Yeah, took care of my need to drive. <laughs> I, I want to hear more about this Office Depot visit. 
Oh, that so sounds thrilling. I bet they'd let you in on your own if you want. I, I, I spent six minutes looking for ink that they had locked up in the back room. Looking for ink they had locked up? Yeah, ink. for some reason they have ink cartridges locked up. So. Oh, I don't know. They are semi-narcotic, right? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't fathom them, yeah. yeah. What kind of paint? Ink. Oh, yeah. ink. Yeah. I, I, I ordered one from Amazon that was shipped by Home Depot. They shipped it in a bubble bag. So yeah. when it got here and I cracked, I, 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 I cut open the print, the, the cartridge, ink poured out everywhere. Nice. Oh, joy. Yeah, I was so happy for that. So then I went to the store to get it and spent at least, I don't know, probably 10 minutes looking for the bloody stuff. And then the guy's like, did you find everything? And I'm like, no. He goes, what do you, I said, he goes, oh, we probably have those locked up in the back. I'm like, wow, can't put up a sign or look at the stupid customer standing there for 10 minutes looking for ink. They were laughing at you. Yeah, they were. <laughs> it's another one. <laughs> Uh, how they're out of business in Staples. Um, yeah, really. I mean, they're both, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I, did I see, I, I think we just got something in the mail reminding us that Office Depot and Office Max are now the same thing too. Yeah, they've been the same thing for quite a while. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. They were bought so out, but I think they're going to get rid of the labeling. That was my excitement for the day. My owls are calling me in the backyard. <laughs> I have a pair of uh, great horned owls that have been out there for now about oh three months maybe. And they start oh. up about this time and they, well, as soon as it gets dark and they go until about midnight and then I think they move to their next spot. So nice. what, they just go who and you say it's me? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And how many pictures have you gotten of them? Only one. One time uh, I was looking out back and something large landed in the tree and I figured it was the Cooper's hawk and I grabbed my camera and it was just the one great horned owl. That was last year, but this pair has been out there uh, for months, like I said. And the other day I figured out what tree they were in because they moved and I saw the flash of the, the wing, but... Uh, then the dogs next door came out and barked and damn uh, dog. <laughs> wait, they, somebody let the dogs out. Yep. Oh, okay. ooh, <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I'm I'm watching a Christmas movie. Can anybody guess which one? Christmas Story. Die Hard. Oh, <laughs> the the eponymous. I was just gonna Die say Hard that too. Christmas movie. That's the one at Dulles, or uh... no? That's the first one, the one in Nakatomi. Oh, that's it. That's it. Uh... Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a Christmas music movie. Yeah. You're kidding. I've never seen it. Shame on me. That's well, the one you know, where I, George I admire Bailey your saves the day, right? I, I I admire your bravery at admitting that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, it, it, no, it was. John McClain that saved the day in that one. Yep. Saves the day in all of them, doesn't it? Pretty much. Hey, speaking of which, have you have you seen the new mini movie that they put together for Die Hard Batteries? What? Yes. Yeah. Do it. Oh, yeah. Do it. It's uh, actually well done. I, I gave them I gave them I gave them serious props for, for the creativity and putting that together. Yeah, that was a super bowl. Well, of course it was during the World Series, right? That's what we uh, saw. It. It, May have been. I don't know when it originally aired. I, somebody sent it to me uh, recently. With uh, Bruce Willis and uh, who's the guy who's driving the the uh, limousine? Uh, oh man, what was his name? Arlie? No. Anyway, Argyle. Yeah, that's it. Argyle. Yeah. So you got him and uh, the 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 criminal mastermind, the the black guy with the glasses that was doing all the computer stuff in the in the original movie. He's back. Um, yeah, it was, it was well done. A new car battery commercial. Oh, I've seen the battery. Yeah, I've seen the commercial a couple times. 
So they've made it. This is a two and yeah, it's two, it's, two, it's actually, two, two minutes and twenty seconds long. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the full thing. Yeah. All right. I'm a. Uh, I'll be back. I got a call coming through. All right. Did I miss the part about uh, is the guy still coming or? Yeah, he's he's coming in. He'll be here okay. momentarily. What what? I'm not I'm not entertaining enough. I'm. I just did the, what you know got in late, and so I wasn't sure what was going on. Yeah, yeah. So we're just doing chit chat uh, like we frequently do at the beginning of our meetings. Oh, uh, John, you need to do the salsa or something like that for your entertainment. Or a little dance. <laughs> Uh yeah, a little dance. That would be all that would be done. Yeah, I'm sure there are some people that would pay real good money to see me sing and dance. Or to not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you find them. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, right. The ones, especially the ones that will pay me not to. Too funny. Michelle, do you pay for that to not see him sing and dance? Hello. Hi, Joe. Hey, guys. Sorry. I've uh, been having some issues with my computer today because I had a power outage earlier with the storm stuff and it's been acting kind of funny. But can you totally see understand? Me You're, okay? I, okay. Yes. Okay. We got your video, we got your audio. Oh, good. It took forever for me to connect for some reason. I'm not sure what was going on with it, but I think it's my system's been running kind of weird ever since the power went out. So, I'm not uh oh, sure. hope it stays up and stable. I think it'd be okay now. Yeah. I, you know, it was earlier today. Um, I'm in Vienna and the whole town lost power. So, it was very, um, I don't know. So anyway, Boy. How are you doing? Oh, we're doing well. Doing well. Glad yeah. to have everybody here. We've got about 45 people in, in the in the room. Oh, um, we're in a good group. A couple faces I recognize. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So um, just a little bit of reminders for club. We do have comp no competition this month because of the Thanksgiving holidays. So this will be the one and only meeting of the club for this month. So everyone have a happy holiday after this. We'll see you back in December. Um, so Joe, I'm gonna ask if you are ready. Yep, I'm gonna do a keynote presentation. So in a minute, let me just- um, Yep, you go ahead and get set and- Double check uh, that that's up. That looks pretty good, okay. And um, I'll go ahead and um, Share my screen with everybody. Yep. So uh, and then, go ahead. You go ahead and do that, and I'll make an intro for you. Okay. Cool. And then, then at the end, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to take those. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So. All right. So tonight. So it's it's just real quick. It's when I'm clicking on screen share, it says um, disabled attendee screen sharing. Oh, really? Yeah. Let me see if I can fix that. Okay. Or you could transfer host to him. Yeah, that's what I was about then to do. Then you could transfer sure. it back. Okay. I'm not sure if that's what I want to do. All right, Joe. Okay. Give it a shot and see if that I'm works for try. you. Okay. Yep. I think that's going to work. Excellent. Cool. So while he's bringing up his presentation tonight, our guest is Mr. Joe Rosbach. And he has a quest as a landscape and nature photographer to showcase wild, beautiful, and unique natural locations and to use his creative vision to capture those landscapes in high quality and evocative images that inspire awe in the viewer and respect for the natural world and ultimately Amen. a greater appreciation of wilderness and wilderness preservation. His images have been published hundreds of times, and he's co-authored two books on nature photography, including The Ultimate Guide to Digital Nature Photography and 50 Amazing Things You Must See and Do in the Greater D.C. Area, and that is The Ultimate Outdoor Adventure Guide. He spent an average of 180 days a year in the field chasing the light, leading 
photography workshops and tours in the U.S. and abroad, and he also teaches online classes at uh, the Art and Nature, uh, the Art of Nature and Landscape Photography through Shutter Monkeys. So tonight, Mr. Joe Rosbach. Well, thank you very much. How's everybody doing tonight? Um, good. Good. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to run you through a presentation on um, advanced composition and use of light, and we'll look at some of my favorite images. Um, I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you guys have at the end of the presentation. Um, presentation is probably about 45 minutes in length, um, possibly a little bit longer, not much. Um, and so everyone can hear me okay and see the screen pretty good? All good. Okay, good. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. All right, let me just click here. And so we'll talk a little bit about vision and style. I think that that is very important for um, any photographer, whether they're working um, in shooting nature or portraiture or any genre of photography should develop for themselves as their own personal style and their own vision towards capturing um, their images. So this is something that, you know, is very important to me and something that I have um, tried to um, hone my skills with over the years and, and constantly uh, make advancements um, and refine my, um, not only my technical, but my creative process in landscape photography. Oh, sorry. So I think for me, the most important thing that a photographer can have, the you know, most important quality that they can have is passion. I think the passion drives everything else. Um, you know, wanting to be out there and create new images often is important to the process. It's very easy to get mired down and, you know, complacent. Um, so for me, uh, keeping that passion up um, really kind of revolves around traveling to new locations. Um, you know, I, oftentimes I visit the same locations over and over again, and that's important in the process as well because um, I get into a different rhythm with the uh, location that I'm shooting. The light is constantly different. The weather is different. And these are all important aspects of, um, of landscape and nature photography. But sometimes it can, you know, it can really ignite the, the fire and the spirit to go to new uh, locations and try to photograph new places. Um, it challenges us and it keeps us fresh. So keeping that passion alive for me has been, um, you know, when I'm, not, when I'm not doing my workshops, which honestly, my workshops occur in locations that I've been shooting in for, you know, very long periods of time, many, many years, which is important when you're running workshops because you need to know the area really well to be able to um, react to whatever's happening with the weather or the light and get clients into the best places possible over that short period of time that you are spending together in that park or wilderness area. Um, but I try to schedule a couple trips every year, whether it's close by or far away to new locations to challenge myself. Uh, just recently I spent some time down in the swamps of uh, Texas and Louisiana, photographing from kayaks and, and small float boats in this really beautiful, uh, kind of hauntingly uh, beautiful area of bald cypress trees and, and back, backwater bayous. And, you know, it was a very challenging situation to be in because I was shooting from um, either a kayak or a boat. Um, but, I found it to be very, very rewarding. And I, you know, I made some images that I'm very, very happy with and I'll, I'll continue to go back to this location uh, in the future. Um, but that's just an example of trying to keep that passion alive is trying new things and trying to photograph new locations. Um, exploration is important for staying fresh. Um, yeah, th this is a shot of a pretty remote uh, bend in the Colorado River that was captured in Arizona. And after photographing um, Horseshoe Bend for many years, which everyone knows about, it's, it's a very iconic location, 
which is just outside of Page, Arizona. I was hoping to find some some new locations in the Southwest that were similar to that location, but offered some, um, you know, a fresh take on it. And by studying uh, by studying um, satellite imagery um, and 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 maps, topographical maps, I was able to locate several uh, areas on the Navajo Indian Reservation. <clears throat> that had some very similar horseshoe style bends um, on the river in northern Arizona. Now this particular location was uh, not an easy one to get to. It didn't involve any long hiking or treks, but it did involve very, very long and rugged off-road travel to get to this location. Now, <clears throat> I was able to actually park my truck on the rim of this canyon, which was pretty amazing. So I was able to set up my tent and hang out in camp, literally on the rim of the canyon with this with this viewpoint. And then I stayed up here for, um, I think it was two or three nights. I think it was probably three nights, I think I stayed up here. And this is over the winter, um, it's very cold. Um, I was just waiting for some some weather to come in. I had, I had clear skies up until this point um, and I had done some some night photography there, but I wanted some you know more dramatic uh, skies or cloud action over this particular bend in the Colorado River. Um, <clears throat> so spending that time really made the the difference. And then exploring the area, I was also able to identify uh, several other bends in the river um, within relative close close proximity to this location. Um, and I, although I haven't been able to make it back to this spot yet, um, it's on my list. Uh, the Navajo Reservation has been sort of um, off limits for travel since uh, COVID happened. So I was actually planning to be out there um, in the summer to try to shoot some of the monsoon um, weather that was coming through the region, but because of COVID, uh, they didn't want uh, travel and uh, all the permit systems were closed down on the reservation. So it'll have to wait, hopefully until maybe next year. We'll see. Uh, composition to me is incredibly important. Um, it is really for me like that, I mean, cause great light can happen for anyone, right? We can all witness amazing displays of light. Putting it together compositionally is what really drives me and I'm always trying to improve my compositional skills and become better at the, um, the art of composition. So this is something that I'm constantly um, striving for. I'm very critical in my own work. Uh, if the compositions don't come together almost perfectly, you probably will never see an image from me. Um, and a lot of times I will revisit locations over and over again um, with a perfect sort of composition in mind. This one location here in the Narrows of Zion National Park is one of those areas that I've kind of shot many times over the years, um, trying to sort of perfect the composition. I'm always drawn to the shape, the shapes in the, in the, in, in the sandstone wall on the far uh, right of the composition and how it kind of leads the eye into the background and creates that sort of vanishing point and, you know, over the years, I've tried to kind of get it right with, um, you know, choice of shutter speed and because shutter speed can affect composition uh, greatly in an image like this, because my choice of shutter speed is going to bring out a certain kind of texture or flow in the water. And what I'm trying to do in a shot like this is sort of mimic um, the shapes that I'm seeing in the uh, sandstone wall in the sort of the flow of the water. So I can kind of create that that, that, that shape symmetry that kind of brings the eye in and creates that vanishing point. So composition is always something I'm chasing um, to sort of really help with that creative vision and style. And then of course, light. Light for us landscape photographers is incredibly important. Um, it is the most important thing. I mean, that's why you will hear photographers say, I am chasing the light. We're literally out there chasing the light around to try to get that best light to match whatever scene it is we're photographing. 
Uh, this is an image of uh, these candlesticks in um, Canyonlands National Park. Well, it's actually not in Canyonlands National Park, but it's near Canyonlands National Park. This is sort of an, uh, a fairly remote area that not that many people know about that sits just outside of the National Park in between the Island in the Sky District and um, Dead Horse Point State Park up on this rim and you have to um, you have to drive out there. It's it's sort of a rough two track road to get out to this location. And um, you can camp out there. It's a little harder nowadays because they've, they've cut the road short by about a half a mile to three quarters of a mile. So you have to park your vehicle a little bit sooner and then hike out the rest of the way to get to the spot, but it's pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> I probably visited this location at least eight or 10 times before I actually got the light that I wanted to get to make the shot work really, really well. <clears throat> so I, I, I wanted some light in the sky. This is at sunset. This, is actually, this, actually, this image was actually taken after sunset uh, during the, um, <clears throat> the twilight hour, during the glow hour. But there was <clears throat> just an amazing amount of color in the clouds in the Western portion of the sky that it was bouncing light down into this canyon and allowing the candlesticks in the in the mid ground and even some of the buttes and stuff in the background to catch that sort of sculpted side light, which was important for a shot like this because even with bracketing exposures, if you don't have that light coming down into the canyon, you, you lose the three dimensional depth that you want for an image like this. It doesn't have the same drama to it. And it just took me a very long time to catch this image because when you're shooting here, if you want light on the candlesticks, it's high in the sky. So the, so the, so the clouds in the sky are not very dramatic at that point. They're sort of washed out. Now <clears throat> you could do, you know, you could handle that a couple different ways. You could say, okay, I'm going to set up a composition and I'll, sh I'll shoot an exposure while the light is actually striking the landscape. And then I'll wait, you know, 20 minutes later after the sun has descended the horizon and shoot a second image with some color in the sky, blend them together. That's one way to do it. Um, and I, I just got honestly very lucky on this evening that the sky lit up the way that it did, but the light coming from the clouds was bouncing or reflecting that light out of the clouds so strongly down onto the landscape that I was able to get this in a single exposure. So that was, that was pretty amazing. So preparing for success when you go on a trip, right? Like you got to put some time in before you get out there to really kind of get an idea of what you're going to be shooting and make a game plan to get the best shots. Um, so for me, that means research. Um, so when I'm, when I'm at home, before I go to an area, I will spend weeks or days, usually weeks, um, a couple hours a day looking at a location. And looking at a location means that I'm gonna be not only scrolling the internet to see what other photographers have shot, if there's anything available at all to look at, just to get an idea of the work that they've done out there and get a visual idea of what the area looks like um, photographically. But it also means uh, looking at satellite imagery. I look at a lot of satellite imagery through Google um, Earth and Google Maps, as well as looking at topographical maps to get an idea of what the train looks like, what the trails are like, what the roads are like, what areas I can access potentially to get into. And then studying um, uh, weather patterns and forecasts for that area. What is the light and the weather like at that time of the year when I'm gonna be planning that trip? What can I expect? Um, also looking at things like uh, photo pills and the photographer's ephemeris to have an idea of the angle of light, where it's gonna be rising, where it's gonna be setting. Um, is there gonna be any opportunity for like, you know, moonlit landscapes or moon rises? Uh, am I gonna be doing any sort of night sky photography with the Milky Way? If so, when, when is that rising? When is it setting? What time of the night is that happening? So on and so forth. So a lot of research and a lot of notes go into these locations. A lot of times I will make um, like basically notes on my phone uh, with uh, my Google Maps where I will drop pins to say this may or may not be a good location to shoot. I don't know yet because I haven't been there. So once I get there, that requires some scouting. 
So I'll have a few shoots planned out already that I may want to do for sunrise or sunset or in a situation like this shot of Zebra Canyon. I know this is not going to be at sunrise or sunset. It's going to be sometime during the day when I have reflected light coming down into this canyon. Um, but what I'll do is I'll spend most of my day um, driving and hiking around to a lot of these pins that I've put down to just get boots on the ground and see what the location looks like and see what the potential is for, you know, good photography there and then make a decision. Well, do I need to be here at sunrise? Do I need to be here at sunset? Is this better shot in the middle of the day? Is a better shot under cloud light? Is a better shot under clear skies? Um, and then once I have a better idea, I can go back to those spots and try to get the shots that I'm looking for. Now, you know, um, I may only have a week, 10 days to shoot this location. So there's only, there's only so many photographs that I'm gonna get that are gonna be good, which is why it's important to sort of return to these spots over and over again throughout the years to sort of continue to uh, refine the photographs that you've already taken of a location, but also to shoot some of those other spots out there that you haven't had a chance to yet. Uh, that's easy for me because I get to travel for my job. Um, this can be done locally, um, anywhere, okay? Um, this, the third thing is when you're preparing for your trip is making sure everything is in working order with your equipment. You have the proper amount of batteries, uh, memory cards, lenses are working, they're clean, uh, camera's in good shape. It's been, you know, the sensor's been cleaned recently, hopefully. This is very problematic, of course. When I come back from a trip in the desert Southwest, I almost have to get my sensor cleaned immediately because you know, just a week of shooting out there and changing lenses, there's so much uh, dust and, 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 and sand like blowing through in the atmosphere that you don't even notice that really dirties up the sensor. So getting your equipment in order. And then when you get there, taking the time, taking the time to really explore the area and, and working really hard, spending the time out there shooting when the light is good. Um, you know, not being lazy about it and having dinner in town and rushing out to a location too late in the day to really, you know, come up with those good compositions. I like to try to make sure that when I'm shooting in a new location or, you know, a lo or even a location that is challenging um, to be there at least a couple hours in advance before the light is really working for me. So I can walk around with my camera and I can line up different compositions. I can sort of try to um, um, imagine what the light's gonna do that evening. Um, I can watch the weather change and, and really you know, spend time with the photographs to make the best ones possible. And then trying to remain inspired. You know? So one of, the, one of the hardest things for me um, with travel these days, because I do so much of it, is is energy you know so when you're doing when i'm doing a multitude of workshops each year and i i'm maybe i only have like a couple trips i can do that are solo i'm, I'm usually squeezing them in in between existing travel and i'm i can honestly be pretty exhausted sometimes so remaining inspired is really important and so there are a few things i try to do to remain inspired when i'm out shooting and one of those is is getting getting rest okay getting rest when possible. So getting a good night's sleep, taking a couple naps during the middle of the day is really important, especially during the longer um, months of the year, you know, from spring through the beginning of fall, when the days can be very long, take some naps in the middle of the day. Uh, fall shooting, late fall, winter, early spring, that's my favorite time to shoot because um, the, the, the days are a little shorter. Um, I can get a longer night's sleep which is important for me um, mentally and physically just to get a good night's sleep. So just trying to remain inspired, looking for new locations, shooting new stuff. You know, it's okay to make mistakes when you're out there shooting. I think that that's an important aspect of being um, creative and, and growing as a photographer or, or an artist in general is trying new things and, and realizing that you're not going to always succeed um, with what you're doing but it may open the door or the window to uh, some different possibilities in your style and your shooting. So, you know, every time I'm on a trip, I try to do, I try to do things a little bit differently if I can, especially if I'm in a location that I've shot many, many times, it's very easy to be like, okay, I can just set up on this composition. I've shot this, you know, a dozen times over the years and I know that it'll work out. Um, but, you know, I think 
trying something very different or something very radical or, you know, whatever um, is an important part of the process. And it doesn't always work out, but, you know, um, it keeps you inspired. It keeps you being creative. Um, so here's a, here's a, an example. Uh, this is a um, set of Native American um, petroglyphs that I photographed in California, outside of Bishop, California. Um, so you can see the Sierra Nevada mountains are in the background. Uh, it's a beautiful area. It took me a long time to, to find this location. Um, so when I, when I was living in California, I would, I would give myself uh, these sort of mini assignments like, you know, you're going to go fo photograph Skyrock. We're going to find Skyrock. We're going to try to get the best shot we can get a Skyrock. It might take a couple months. This spot was hard to find because no one, it's, it's very, it's, it's a very like closely guarded secret amongst not only photographers, but also like hikers. And I couldn't even get information out of the, um, um, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, which uh, th which is where this is located, on where it is located. They don't even tell people. They, they give you a very general idea, but they won't give you any sort of like hiking or GPS coordinates to get there. So this was like sort of a, a, a mini project of mine. I was like, I, I, first of all, I need to find this spot and then I need to get a good photograph of it. So I was actually able to find it by scouring the internet and just doing Google searches on it. And I found a young woman um, who was she's not a photographer, she's just a hiker who had a blog and she had shots of it. And I downloaded her image off of her blog and I was able to look at her metadata, which had she had not turned the GPS coordinates off on her camera. So I had a pretty good idea of where it was at that point. I was able to identify it on Google Maps. It wasn't completely accurate where her GPS point was, but it was it was then about um, maybe less than one eighth of a mile from where this rock is located. So then once I had an idea of where it was, where I thought it was, I was able to get out there and park and go hike and looking for it, okay? <clears throat> once I found it, I actually found a, a road that comes in from the top, a very rough road over this sort of like volcanic landscape. And I was able to actually camp up there and stay there you know, many, many nights, which was really nice. This is actually on Thanksgiving evening um, about, three years ago, I actually spent Thanksgiving up there and um, I camped for two nights and I shot sunrise and sunset. And then I would also hike out to the rock um, overnight and set up some, some lights and do some star photography as well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, compositional techniques, okay? Because yeah. composition is just so important. You know, composition and light, are really the, the, the two factors that make, in my opinion, a really, really successful landscape photograph. That, honestly, that could be said about like pretty much any genre of photography, I think. Um, so I like a lot of times to go for a very near to far effect, a very wide angle near far landscape is good for me. Uh, this particular shot was taken up at um, White Pockets in Northern Arizona. And by getting in very, very low with a very wide lens, this is shot with a 14 millimeter lens, it um, takes in this beautiful sweeping foreground, which by the way, unless you're getting down low with a wide angle, the foreground doesn't look like that. So the wide angle lens is gonna distort that perspective up front. So you can't really see it with the human eye. You can train your brain to sort of have an idea of what things are gonna look like when you shoot this enough, but you're really only gonna see this until you put on that ultra wide angle lens and you get down very low and close to the foreground for a shot like this. So it creates this beautiful sweep in the foreground, which is gonna move the eye into the background. It creates a lot of energy and a lot of movement in the image. <clears throat> of course, there are a lot of things coming together in a shot like this. I mean, the, the atmosphere was, was wonderful because the storm is passing through. Um, at, this is just after sunrise, by the way. Um, there was water up on the plateau so you had these the wonderful pools of reflecting water. Honestly, this shot would not be successful, in my opinion, without that middle ground of reflected water, uh, reflecting the clouds in it. You know, it really adds a lot of depth to a landscape like this. Um, think abstract. Think in the abstract. Use bold shapes to construct a composition. So this shot is all about um, triangles. 
you know? The lighting is not, you know, superlative. It's nothing insane. There was some good texture in the clouds. It's a twilight shot. So it's sort of a, you know, that blue, blue hour sort of an image. So you can imagine that if I was just standing out here photographing like a, you know, just a little bit of water or this blank desert, it'd be a very uninteresting photograph, you know? What makes the photograph compelling is the shapes in the foreground. So these are just basically, you know, um, this is just salt formations on this playa. Um, and there's little channels of water running through. It's a very mucky area to walk through. It's kind of like a nasty, muddy area. This is out in Death Valley National Park, by the way. Um, so just using these sort of shapes really can create that engaging foreground that makes the photo, all right? And that's just a matter of sort of exploring around. I barely got this shot off because I was, I was wondering, I was wandering around on this playa and I was sort of very frustrated because I wasn't finding anything that looked great. Um, and then all of a sudden I literally stumbled upon these. And, you know, once again, this is with a wide angle lens. So they appear much larger in the photograph than they are in reality because of that wide angle distortion with foreground elements. Um, so just wandering up onto this and looking through the camera, I was like, all right, here we go. This is the shot that I've been looking for. And just in time too, because I was running out of light. This is a pretty long exposure. This is close to, uh, it was between 30 seconds and one minute. I don't remember exactly, but it was a fairly long exposure. The light was getting very low at this point. So here's another example of using very bold shapes, right? Once again, this is just, I'm using water this time to create that bold shape, water and shutter speed combination to create these incredible, very graphic Vs in the foreground, okay? So too long of an exposure and I lose that shape. You know, so it's a matter of kind of getting that exposure just right with the shutter speed to create that foreground shape that creates a lot of energy, all right? So that's definitely something I'm always looking for, especially when I'm doing this wide angle stuff. Up front, the foreground has to be engaging, has to be powerful. Um, really has to engage the viewer so they want to spend some time in the photograph. So everyone always talks about using leading lines, okay? And that's absolutely important. Um, I prefer my lines to do a little bit of meandering. So I like this because of this beautiful S-curve that continues to, you know, um, run all the way through the image into the background. You could imagine in this shot, if the, if the line of the water was a straight line running through, it wouldn't have the same sort of energy that it does with this beautiful S curve, okay? So look for those, um, look for those abstract lines and shapes to transport your viewer deeper into your photograph. That's, so that's something that you wanna create with landscape photography is greater depth and visual flow. You want the viewer to feel like they can actually walk into the image and experience it for themselves. Um, so using these sort of lines is a really excellent compositional tool to create that sort of depth in an image, all right? Once again, here's another sort of an, it's more sort of an S curve, almost a C curve that's happening here. Um, there's a bunch of shapes that are working here though. You'll notice the rock in the far right corner is triangular and it points the eye right towards that S curve, right? So the S curve is moving the eye back in towards the smaller waterfall in the background. And then we have some, this sort of circular shape happening with the swirling leaves over in the corner. Um, and it's just really nicely composed. It's tightly composed. I zoomed in a little bit it's with a wide angle lens, but probably, you know, I think for this shot, I was, it was taken at about 24 or 30 millimeters. So it wasn't like ultra wide because I didn't want to just, you know, I didn't really want to distract the viewer on an image like this. If I went any wider, it pulls in, um, you know, some some stuff on the side of the landscape that isn't all that attractive, fallen trees and, and branches and things like that. So zooming in a little bit and focusing on just that beautiful sort of curving line that's formed by the longer exposure and the leaves rushing through moves the eye right into the waterfall and creates that energy once again. Um, you can craft a composition around a point of light, okay? So by all means, this shot would like, uh, you know, a lot of people would, would, would throw it out or poo-poo on it because it is, you know, a composition that is completely centered, right? 
So my main subject, that light coming through the canyon is smack dab in the middle of the frame, which if you go by the quote unquote rules of photography is something you should never do. But it works for this image. It works for this image um, because there's symmetry on both sides of that dividing line, okay? There's symmetry on both sides and it's pulling the eye into the middle, which creates a very strong composition, all right? So, you know, this is something you can do when you're working um, with re reflections of something in a body of water. You know, it's okay to put the horizon right in the center as long as you have that sort of top to bottom or side to side symmetry happening that can really create a very pleasing effect for the image. Lead the eye, make sure that you lead the eye where you want the eye to go, all right? So there's no sense of using a leading line or a leading anchor or an object unless it's leading to something good into the composition. So, you know, for this shot, I want the eye to move back towards those sort of snakehead sandstone buttes in the background, right? So it's, it's important for me just to be able to move the camera a little bit left and right to make sure that those sandstone humps in the foreground with those radiating lines move the eye directly to that area in the background, okay? So it creates that visual rhythm, that visual flow that works through the shot. Um, I can tell you for a fact, if you move about four or five uh, feet to the left or to the right, compositionally, it just doesn't work out, work out there. I've tried it many times. And you know that's one thing that um, Ansel Adams said is sometimes the difference between a good photograph and a great photograph is just a few feet. So you just gotta be able to move around a little bit and make sure that those eye, the eye is led to wherever the photographer wants it to go in the background. Make sure that those lines don't lead off to the side or to something erroneous in the composition. Um, use con you can use converging lines and light to create greater depth in the landscape. Now, this is what I would, you know, call one of my more intimate landscapes, right? Uh, this is about light and shape only, really, in this image. The subject matter is inconsequential, you know? It could be of anything. This happens to be sand dunes that were captured in um, Southern California um at um sunrise or just after sunrise and with a very long lens this is with about a 400 millimeter lens to to um, stack that perspective up okay stack those dunes up in a pleasing way and then waiting for the light to be just right so you'll notice on every dune there's a little bit of light hitting what i would call the slip edge of the dune right so that's creating that that, that depth in the image between um, shadow and light all the way through and, and, and it creates that greater depth. That's a very difficult thing to do when you're doing an intimate landscape with a very long lens. Um, it, those images tend to become very two-dimensional and flat in nature. So having that perfect amount of convergence of light and line will allow those images to have much, much more three-dimensional depth to them. Uh, look for vanishing points, you know, so you could think of a railroad track running through the woods, right? That creates a very obvious vanishing point. Uh, in this image, it's the lines in the canyon and the light, more specifically, that's coming from the back end of the canyon, all right? Um, and so I, I, I waited around for a good deal of time until that light was glowing just back there in the perfect spot to sort of create that, that that vanishing point. So you can use light and you can use color and, and, and lines to all create these beautiful vanishing points. It creates a great amount of mystery in the image um, when you have a vanishing point because the eye or the mind has to wonder where is the, where is the image going? What, what is back there? What does it lead to? So there's that little bit of mystery which can be very compelling for a lot of viewers when you, when you work with something like that. Uh, this by the way, as far as technicals is concerned, uh, wide angle shot, 14 millimeters. I'm in very, very, very close to those canyon walls, literally inches away, three, four inches from the side of the wall. So this image is focus stacked um, to, to get uh, the depth of field necessary to make sure that the image is sharp um, all the way from foreground to, to background. So it's about, probably about five or six images, maybe seven. I don't remember. Between five and seven, seven images in total focus stack to make sure that the entire image is completely sharp. 
Um, once again, use those bold shapes. Now this is a very different shape. This is taken out on the same playa that I photographed uh, earlier at twilight with those triangular shapes. Uh, this time I'm using um, circular salt formations, all right? Just as interesting, but it creates a completely different feeling to the image. It's a little softer, okay? It's, it's not quite as energetic, um, but it works really, really well. So, so look for those bold shapes. I wandered around for a good period of time until I found the perfect sort of circular oval salt patterns that I could put together um, for sunset on this evening. Use a long lens for stacking elements in a composition. You know, this is one of a long lens is you know, this is one of my favorite um, combinations when I'm photographing in the mountains, especially when there's storms in the mountains, because I know that I can stack up those mountain layers, okay, um, against hopefully some good light and some good atmosphere. Uh, this was taken in the um, Sierra, Sierra, Sierra Nevada mountains in California over uh, the winter. I think it was in February when I took this, January, or February. Um, when the high winds come in. So there can be some very high wind storms that hit the uh, Sierra Mountains and the Owens Valley and the Death Valley area. They're all very close to one another out there. And so, you know, what's happening in a shot like this is all the drama is caused by the wind picking up that uh, snow and creating spin drift. And then I'm waiting for the light to come down behind it and backlight the scene, right? So I get that beautiful glowing light in the image but with a very long lens. So this is, um, this is with about a uh, 500 millimeter lens to photograph these, these, mountain, range, uh, these mountain ridges uh, from the desert floor below me, uh, probably about you know, half a mile off from where the range is. Here's another example of a long lens stacked landscape, very long lens with the moon dropping over these aspens in um, Southwest Colorado, okay? Uh, and this is actually a single exposure with the moon. This is not a double exposure. I've done double exposure moon shots before, but I was able to get away with this one, with single exposure. Moon is in the right place. Long lens um, exaggerates the size of the moon. And it also allows me to frame up the best elements against the moon and make it look nice and big. <clears throat> Working on patterns in nature. Once again, getting back to the intimate side of things. You know, something that many people would walk past and not pay attention to fallen cottonwood leaves <clears throat> in, a, in a small, um, basically, um, puddle of water, <laughs> you know, uh, captured in Zion National Park. Um, so I noticed these, and they were lovely, very beautiful, but they needed some reflected color to come through. So I actually was out hiking in the morning, shooting other stuff. I noticed these leaves, and I thought, okay, these look good, but they're sort of drab right now. If I come back late in the afternoon when the canyon wall behind them is being lit. And I knew that it would be just based on where the sun was arcing through the canyon. I knew I could get reflected color in this pool of water. So it's just a matter of coming back with a long lens and using um, you know, um, the long lens to create these beautiful, wonderful you know, uh, capture of patterned leaves and color in the water. This was once again, a focus stacked image. Um, There's no way that I was gonna get this sharp at 200 millimeters, even stopping down to like F22. I just, I tried a couple that way and it was just a little soft in the background. I wanted this to be sharp all the way through because I knew if I printed this big, I'd want there to be detail from corner to corner of the print. You know, that's what I wanted for this. So I did focus stack this. It was three images at F11, one focused up front, one in the middle, and then one in the background and then put together in Photoshop. Very simple thing to do, by the way. Uh, use motion to create uh, lines in a composition. So this is something I kind of touched on just a little bit earlier with that shot from Ricketts Glen of the um, triangular water in the foreground. You know, playing around with your choice of um, ISO and shutter speed combination can create uh, a different effect when you're photographing water. So, you know, I'm playing around with the, the shutter speed on a shot like this, this reflected color um, in the Virgin River in Utah. Uh, just to create some interesting shapes with the use of the shutter speed. Uh, once again, like I love shooting intimate landscapes just as much as I sh love shooting grand landscapes. So, you know, intimate landscapes honestly have become like sort of my passion. Um, I think grand landscapes get um, the most uh, bang for the buck as far as like um, likes and adoration and things like that. But I really love shooting these sort of more intimate scenes. 
Um, on the left is just sandstone detail in Arizona with a wide angle lens. And once again, the wide angle is distorting those uh, striations in the sandstone and it's creating those beautiful shapes. Um, on the top right are three uh, fallen cottonwood leaves amongst oil and reflections. And then the bottom is ice formations photographed with a macro lens. Um, just once again, focusing on design and abstract qualities in the image. So here's another example of a very intimate abstract shot, a single backlit um, aspen leaf with some light coming through on it. Um, using a very, very shallow um, depth of field, I was shot this at about F4 to kind of completely blur the background uh, to create that beautiful bokeh, okay? And then just put my focus on the leaf itself um, and then waiting for the light, sort of the light to come through. There was actually a lot of, um, uh, it was like a, like a foggy mist kind of coming through the atmosphere that morning. And that kind of created that sort of interesting light in the background when it was out of focus. So I was playing around with that to create, create that, that beautiful uh, light. Uh, try to capture from an entirely different perspective. Like, so drone photography has become very um, near and dear to my heart. I love doing drone photography where it's, you know, I can do it without, you know, breaking any laws or without annoying other people. <laughs> which is the challenging part of doing drone photography yeah. because they are really annoying. And I, you know, so, but like one of my favorite spots to do drone stuff is out in um, so, some of the areas in Northern Arizona and Southern Utah, especially around the Hanksville area of Southern Utah is a gold mine for drone photography. It's legal there because it's all BLM land. It's no national park land there. Um, and it is, there's no towns around. And you rarely ever run into any other photographers or hikers out there. So you feel like you can fly a drone very nicely without annoying people. And you're looking down on the spine of the earth out there in the desert, which is one of the most beautiful abstract areas from above that I've, you know, I've ever seen. So yeah, you can get some incredible stuff out there, but you can get it anywhere with the drone. I, I you know, I oftentimes fly it. I've, I did a lot of stuff this fall. Um, up in West Virginia and Vermont and um, with my drone uh, photographing fall colors from above and photographing along lakes and ponds and, and marshy wetland areas which look pretty amazing with the drone. <clears throat> so yeah, try to, you know, change your perspective. This is another shot from out there in Southern Utah above those Martian badlands with the drone. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about light, capturing light. Uh, so this is an image from um, the same area where I launched my drone to photograph those aerial um, abstractions. And this is an area that's just outside of Hanksville, Utah. It's in between Hanksville and Capitol Reef National Park. And it's called the um, San Rafael Swell of Utah. And that formation in the background is Factory Butte. Um, and it's a beautiful location to shoot in. And it's, it's, it's wild and it's remote and it is completely unvisited by many people. Um, so what I'm looking here for is this quality of light. So one of my favorite times of the year <clears throat> to be out shooting, well, favorite times of the year for photography is during the summer. I don't like shooting during the summer because the days are so long and it's just exhausting because you don't get very much sleep. You're up very early in the morning, you're out very late in the evening. Um, it's hot in this part of the desert in the summer, but this is when the monsoon season happens. And that's when your chances of getting the most dramatic light are gonna come through. This was shot at sunset, looking back, obviously to where the sun is setting right before it hits the horizon. Uh, got lucky, sun uh, broke through the clouds. Uh, there's a verga coming down, it's raining. It was raining on me like 20 minutes ago before I shot this. Um, and I really loved it. You know, I, I like the way that the light is hitting the foreground rocks. It creates a lot of depth. Sunburst is a very um, powerful thing. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can use side light to create texture and depth, okay? So this is um, Lone Pine Peak in the Eastern Sierra, photographed with a telephoto lens. Um, and you can see there's actually some stars tracking through in the image, right? So this is actually a, a twilight shot. Now this is something that happens out. So this is what we would call Alpen glow, right? This is when the mountain is actually receiving some light well before sunrise is actually happening. 
right? Um, and so what's happening in an image like this is there's a cloud bank out on the eastern horizon. It's clear where I am, but out on the east, it's a huge cloud bank. They call them Sierra waves out there. And it's catching light and it's actually bouncing a lot of that light across down into the mountains um, well before sunrise. Uh, well, far enough for sun, far enough before sunrise, and it's actually letting some of the stars come through. But the side light is creating this texture and depth in the mountain that you're not going to get with other types of lighting situations. The sun is behind the mountain; you're not going to see that. If it's right to your back and it's front lit, you're not going to have those areas of light and shadow that are going to create that three dimensional depth in the image. Um, so side lighting is going to bring out the textures and the depth, um, you know, like it does in these dunes. These dunes do not look as dramatic unless there's light on them and it's coming from um, a, you know, a, a 45 degree angle to the dunes where it's creating light and shadow slips. It creates those beautiful lines and, and, um, and all that shadow and light play in an image like this using that side light. Um, I, I like to use spotlighting quite a bit when I'm working with my telephoto landscape. So you can see in an image like this, um, the light is just striking that one small portion of these um, badlands in California, and it's creating a spotlight effect on the image, which will create more depth and break up um, um, the, the, the light in the photograph. So you have those sort of shadow and then boom, spotlight right in the middle. Once again, here's another example of using sort of spotlight to create a little bit more depth and drama in your shots. This is a long telephoto image, 400 millimeters of um, um, cottonwood trees and um, reeds, basically, in um, the Owens Valley of California. So with that long lens, it's a beautiful shot, but once the light comes up and it just starts to spotlight a portion of the frame, it creates that sort of energy and it creates that depth in the photo. I'm sorry, let me turn my phone down. Shoot into the sun. You know, this is a very challenging situation when you're shooting towards the sun because you have to deal with dynamic range. Um, but there are many ways that we can deal with dynamic range through either bracketing or through processing techniques to bring out shadow and highlight detail. So I'm right here, I'm shooting into the sun. Um, I'm kind of laying down on my back, shooting up into the aspen forest. This is a classic sort of shot. There's nothing new here uh, with the sun coming through with the sun star, but it's beautiful. So try to shoot into the sun to create that sort of dramatic effect. Here's another example of shooting into the aspen forests, shooting into the sun, okay? So these really cool curvy trees and then the backlight. So there's actually no light hitting those foreground trees. They're all in shade, right? So I'm underexposing the frame and just keeping my highlights in check and then lifting my shadows and doing some, um, some dodging and burning to sort of work out the balance of light in the in the photograph afterwards and then you know that sunburst coming through the forest would add a lot of uh, energy to the shot wait for the best light you know be patient this light came probably a good 15 to 20 minutes after sunset and sunset was not anything to, to talk about it was actually very bland uh there was no color in the sky I was with the workshop group, we were, we were sitting out on this playa. And um, so we had a great composition lined up with these channels of water leading towards uh, the mountains in the background. And there was clouds in the sky, but they weren't illuminating um, at sunset. And we had clients that were like, hey, let's, we had a long walk back to the car, probably a mile and a half over this sort of um, muddy playa, which takes a while to walk that. Um, and it was starting to get like a little bit muddy and a little bit dark. I was like, let's just wait around a few more minutes, um, see what happens. And then boom, all of a sudden the sun got low enough in the sky, the clouds were high enough in, 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 in the sky as well that it started to underlight. And this happened for just about five minutes, not even maybe, this beautiful light came out. If we had left a little earlier, we would have missed it completely. So wait for the light, it's important. Uh, here's an image I photographed in the Narrows of Zion. Um, I probably waited in this spot for this bounce light to come in for close to an hour, standing in the water. Cause I could, I could see the light in the top of the canyon walls kind of moving across the scene. And I had this really nice composition lined up 
It was just a matter of waiting for the light to really kind of reflect down into that portion of the canyon where those cottonwood trees were in the background to make it work. Shoot twilight and, and go with long exposures. You can create some very creative things shooting in these twilight conditions with very long exposures. So you can see this is a Joshua tree. Um, this was photographed out in um, uh, what's a, an area called Whitney Pockets in Nevada. And there's, this is a very long exposure, it's a several minute exposure with the moon behind the clouds. That's the source of light that you see in the frame is the moon. It's up in the sky. It's only, it's only a crescent moon. It's not much light coming off of it. A full moon would have blown out completely. It would have been unshootable. But it was just a little crescent moon back there, just creating a little bit of light in the background. And then a very long exposure. You can see with a very long exposure, the clouds are streaking across the frame, creating that sort of very painterly effect to it. Um, you know, when you're doing something like this, you need movement in the sky, but you don't want movement in, you know, your landscape. Like, so like if the wind were blowing around, that it pro the image probably would not have been successful because the parts of the Joshua tree would have been out of focus and it would have been blurred. It wouldn't have looked very good. So, you know, right conditions are important. And then on the same evening, actually this was taken the next morning um, at about I don't know, maybe about five o'clock in the morning, that same storm that was coming through that was, I was using the long exposures for created some really dramatic lightning the next morning. Uh, once again, this is a very long exposure, right? This is a five minute exposure. And what I'm, let, what, I'm ha what I'm doing here is I'm just letting the camera over the course of this very long exposure record different um, lightning strikes in the sky. So this is actually about three or four different lightning strikes that came down during the course of that five minute exposure um, during very, very deep twilight conditions to get the shot. And I, you know, honestly, I probably shot a dozen very long exposures and then only one of them was successful where the lightning actually looked really good in the frame. But you can use uh, these very long exposures at twilight or at night to create some very creative things. Work with bounce light, you know? So in an image like this, it has a lot of beautiful light to it, but th it was all in the shade. This is just light reflecting or bouncing down from a, from a source of light above the image, the composition. So above it, the canyon walls are brightly lit and that, that color is bouncing down into those lower walls. You can tell by the look of the water, it's a pretty long exposure. This is about an eight to 15 second exposure here. Um, even though that light looks so bright, it's a very, very soft, low light with that bounce light, but it creates very beautiful conditions. Here's another example of shooting with bounce light. This is a very remote slot canyon out on the Navajo reservation um, in, um, in Northern Arizona, not, not Antelope, by the way, um, or any of the ones around Page. Um, and this is just light bouncing down into the top of the canyon and spreading that light out through the canyon. Once again, pretty long exposure for this. And then also focus stacked. This image is about five images focus stacked because I'm in very, very close in this very narrow canyon with a wide angle lens. So my lens is only, you know, five, six inches away from the canyon wall. No way I'm gonna get it sharp all the way through on a single exposure. So focus stacked with that light coming through, very challenging situation to shoot in. Um, look for those warm and cool combinations. This is something I always look for in my photography is that sort of warm, cool mix. It adds a lot of energy to the image. That, that, that sort of mix between the you know, warm colors and the cool colors can add a lot of juxtaposition and energy and color to the photographs. So what's happening here is warm uh, bounce light is coming down from the top of the walls that are being brightly lit. And then by keeping my, my white balance basically at a daylight white balance, the areas that are falling in shade or not receiving any bounce light are coming out with this really cool bluish tone from the sky above. Bad weather equals great light, okay? It just can, it doesn't always, but these are the conditions I'm always looking for is when the storms are coming in or moving out. And that's when I wanna be out trying to chase that light around because I'm gonna get that sort of dr drama. Uh, this is again, one. once again, this is up in White Pockets in Northern Arizona. So one of the first shots we showed in the uh, slides um, was the sandstone with the pool of water in the middle. This is from the same area, just up on the Brain Rock. 
And this was taken during the summer when the monsoon season was happening and just a big thunderstorm is coming through at sunset. So I have light on the landscape. Light is striking those rocks and giving me that rich contrast and quality of light. But I have these really dark, ominous skies in the background from that storm that's coming through. And honestly, about five, 10 minutes after I took this photo, had to run and take cover because it turned into a lightning storm out there. And it was actually a little bit scary. Here's another example of using that sort of bad weather to create a dramatic landscape image. This is in Southwest Colorado in fall, obviously, as uh, a two day storm is beginning to lift in the mountains. And for the first time in two days, you can finally see the peaks again. They're just beginning to become clear as the storm is breaking up. You can see there's even some light that's um, illuminating the hillsides uh, in the midground of the image. The sun's starting to break out finally after two days. Um, but it creates that sort of mystery and that drama that you want in your landscape images. And this is the stuff I really look for um, with the big landscapes. Uh, you know, the golden hour, that hour after sunrise and before sunset is a perfect time to be out shooting. Um, and you're going to get these wonderful uh, shadows that come through the image if you shoot um, you know, with the sun and side lit uh, or even backlit, you're going to get some beautiful shadows. It's going to add and sculpt the image and make it perfect. Uh, this is in Zion once again, up on um, checkerboard Mesa. And you can see the sun coming in from the side at that low angle of light is really what's allowing these sort of sandstone striations to stand out and create that line that leads towards the mountain in the background. Without that light being low at that golden hour, um, that sandstone looks very flat. It doesn't have much interest to it. It needs to be low and low and angular to create those shadows, to create that depth. Another example of um, golden hour uh, side light. So you can see the way that it's um, sort of spotlighting the trees and the mountain through the frame. So that's creating depth through the uh, through light uh, lighting. Okay, if the sun were and if an hour earlier in the summer, a bit higher, the whole forest is bathed in light as well as the mountain range in the background. So it doesn't have that sort of shadow and light play. That depth isn't there any longer. And then of course, shooting right up to the edge of light, right before the sun is about to tip the horizon. This particular photograph has been one of my, my best sellers over the years. Um, it was photographed in um, the, um, Coyote Buttes Wilderness of Northern Arizona. It's a long hike into this particular spot to photograph this particular piece of sandstone. And this sandstone only gets this light in the winter, January and February, um, to get this really warm edge of light. A lot of the other images you'll see from this location, the light is much stronger. And that's because you have to shoot it a little earlier in the day because to the west of where you're shooting this is, um, a line of cliffs that is quite tall relative to where you're shooting the sandstone from. They're quite tall above you. So they block the light, you know, kind of an hour, hour and a half before sunset even happens and this area kind of goes into the shade. But there's a notch in those cliffs. And in mid-January through roughly mid-February, the sun sets in that notch in the cliffs. So you get that edge of light that strikes this only in the winter. And it's pretty, pretty uh, fantastic. You can see how the light is just hitting the two buttes and there's like shadow in between and it creates that, that gorgeous depth in the image. And once again, this is another edge of light shot, okay? So this is out in Colorado in Great Sand Dunes National Park. And just waiting for the sun, you know, having a composition lined up and then waiting for that perfect time to click the shutter when the sun is very low on the horizon and that light is just, just skimming the dune field and it's creating that light and shadow, which creates those beautiful leading lines. The sun's a little bit higher. You don't have that light and shadow. You don't have those lines any longer. Composition is not there. So light and composition play together with one another quite often. Shoot the moon, you know? Uh, this is a shot of Lone Pine Peak, which is the one that we saw earlier that was telephoto. This is with a wide angle lens down in the Alabama Hills, framed through um, 
an arch out there. And I decided I wanted to do this a little bit differently. So I was, I planned it using um, photo pills, which is a software that allows me to look at where the sun is rising and setting and where the moon is rising and setting and on any given day of the year um, and look at it with, uh, you know, augmented reality and top topographical maps. And I could place that the, you know, the moon would be, um, would be setting right above the peak in between the arch um, at this time of the year in the winter. And so I was able to get out there and get set up for it and, and capture the moon coming down in, in between the arch above the, above the mountain range at twilight. And then by the next day, um, the shot's gone because the moon is setting too high in the sky. So when you get there at twilight, it's actually behind the top of the arch at that point. You can't see it. You can't get it to work out compositionally. So you have a 24 hour window to get an image like this. This is out in the same location in the Alabama Hills, different arch. This is lady boot arch. Um, and this is the moon rising. Okay. So the other, other, the other one was uh, moonset. This is moonrise. Um, so, in, you know, a lot of times when I do my moon shots, I like to incorporate them into the composition like they're the sun in a way. You know, so you can see that the moon doesn't have any detail in it. It's glowing like the sun would. I've used a small aperture to create that sort of sun star effect, even with the moon. And then I used artificial lighting to bounce light into the rocks because they're backlit, obviously to create some depth and some light in the foreground. And I just used a gel on the light to sort of match the quality of warm light that's coming from the moon um, during uh, the deep twilight period. Of course, going out and shooting the night sky, people love to do that. This is Double Arch in Arches National Park, photographed in the winter um, against the night sky. So high ISO, like 3200 ISO, 15 second exposure, to get the stars and then a second exposure um, at a lower ISO, ISO 400 at about F8 with a very, very powerful flashlight with a gel on it to paint the interior of the arch and then blend it together, okay? That way that I'm getting a shot that isn't that doesn't have a lot of grain in it in, in, in the rocks. And I can do just a little bit of noise reduction for the sky and get a quality print out of it. This is another shot. This is the Milky Way, you know, perfect Milky Way alignment lined up to this arch. <clears throat> and I used um, uh, what's called a loom cube, which is a little tiny cube that you can set up wherever you want. And they run for a couple hours and you can even put gels on them. You can even use your phone to control the intensity of the light coming out of the loom cube to sort of put light inside of this arch. And then um, just timed it where the Milky Way was arcing down um, out of the corner of the frame um, into the, into the arch. So worked out pretty well. Once again, I used uh, photo pills to, 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 um, to plan the shot out for the right time of the year to do that. And okay, that's my presentation. So I'll stop my screen share and then I'll allow you guys to ask me any questions that you might have. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm back. Hello. Great. So Everyone is pretty, pretty much everyone's on mute. So if you have a question, please be sure to unmute your mic. Yeah, Nothing Charles, has appeared uh, in chat yet. Go ahead, go ahead, Charles. Okay, Joe, uh, at any hey, time do you make an effort to show scale in some of your images or is that considered sacrilegious? No, man, I'll definitely use scale sometimes. And I don't, I don't consider that to be sacrilegious at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't do it very often. I've done it with a few of my images, like throwing a person in it or whatever, you know? Um, I don't. I think that for a long time, I was sort of like, nah, I don't, I don't wanna do that. Um, but I don't I don't feel that way any longer. I'm, I'm okay with giving the image scale or throwing a man-made object into it, whether it's a person or, or whatever, to give the image a sense of scale. I think that's totally fine. By the way, love your images, they're great. <laughs> Thanks buddy, I appreciate it. Who else has a question? Open to anything. <laughs> Can you hear me? I'm on. I'm on. Yes. Hi. Um, Joe, you do um, events or you take people out on outings locally? Yeah. Um, so um, things we scaled back a little bit this year with COVID, obviously. <laughs> Um, been doing a lot of online education, uh, webinars, and, and even 
classes. I'm, I'm teaching classes with um, with Ian Plant, as I'm sure many of you know Ian, and I've worked with, I've known Ian for a very long time and we worked together on a lot of projects. Um, but yeah, we, I'm still doing workshops. I'll be doing workshops again in 2021, um, probably about five or six um, week long workshops. And then the rest of the stuff will be local outings in the sort of mid Atlantic region, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Chesapeake Bay area and stuff like that. So um, I don't have my schedule up yet, but I'm working on it. So it'll probably be, be up in the next like you know, week or two, but um, everything will be on the website when it, when it goes live. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. I was wondering what uh, platform you use for your website. I use Squarespace, which um, I've been pretty happy with. I've had to do some workarounds um, with Squarespace. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty good. It's it's pretty easy to use. You can pretty you can nicely create like a very customizable website with it. Um, it's not that expensive, but some of the things that I'm going to be a little bit critical on it is um, it's not it's SEO or search engine optimization isn't as strong sometimes as I would like it to be. Um, and so for that reason, I'm probably switching over to a custom site that I have a guy that is going to build for me this winter, which um, is through wide range galleries. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of wide range. It's a, um, it's a photographer by the name of uh, Jack Bauer and he actually does custom websites as well and they're, Wait, they're, be they're beautiful the jack bauer the jack bauer yeah man like the jack <laughs> the mountain jack um so yeah i'm gonna have jack build me a website because his seo stuff is just like in incredible and he knows way more about it than I, I if i were smarter i could probably get away with doing it properly with squarespace but it's it's not as easy but from a design perspective it's very nice looking everything it loads is, yeah. very well and i'm happy with it from that perspective anybody else all right who else has a question well um if you guys get a chance i'll send out an email to samantha um just thanking you guys with a couple links in there but if you get a chance to you know take a look at my website if you haven't done that already, I really appreciate that. It's josephrossback.com. And you can sign up for my mailing list over there if you're not on it. And I usually send out, you know, mailer about twice a month, once a month um, on a slow month um, with, you know, updates on webinars and workshops that I'm doing, as well as new images and um, uh, just inspirational and educational content in the, uh, in the mailers. So um, doesn't cost you anything and you can unsubscribe at any time, but it's a really easy way to stay in touch with my work and, and the, the stuff that I'm offering. So I, that'd be great. If you guys get a chance to do that. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, we'll definitely spread those around. Thank you. All right. Last call for questions for Joseph. Really great pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful I have a, can I ask a question? We have a question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I loved your images also, and mm -hmm. um, I have uh, many times tried to take shots where I'm, you know, manipulating the shutter speed to try to get that nice smooth look to waterfall, water, and et cetera, and right. you would think it would be fairly easy, but I never can <laughs> get those shots the way I want them to. I mean, are you, are you doing focus stacking or, I mean, how, how are you getting that drama into, into your water? I mean, I'm, I'm not really doing a lot of focus stacking with, with even a lot of my work, to be quite honest with you. I'd say that maybe in my entire portfolio of images, maybe 10%, 15% max are, are focus stacked images. So most of them are just captured sort of traditionally. I, I play around a lot with, um, the, the, I'll, I'll even use a high ISO a lot of times. I'll, what I'll do is I'll do a lot of blending, okay? So for a lot of my water images, um, a lot of those are blends of two or three exposures. Oh. So I might do one exposure at a very long, like yeah. maybe um, four seconds, for example, right? Yeah. 
and then I'll do one at a half of a second. And then I might even do one at like, you know, one, one over 15 or one over 30th of a second, just to get different levels of movement and texture in different areas of the water. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll creatively blend them together into a single image. Right. So like the back of the waterfall might have the four second exposure to get that sort of silky look. Oh, but the yeah. foreground where I want there to be some, some texture and some shape might be at a quarter of a second. And okay. so that's kind of my best way to do that is to sort of blend them together because I find a lot of times with the really long exposures, you know, you lose some of that, right? Yeah, you lose the drama. You lose some of that drama, right? So you gotta, you gotta kind of work with a different, couple different exposures and then, you know, creatively put them together and, and, and post afterwards, which is not that difficult to do. I just did a webinar a couple of weeks ago called creative image blending where we, that was one of the examples we talked about was using bracketed shutter speeds on water to blend together one of the other things we did was used um it was a telephoto shot with like light hitting different parts of the mountain at different times of the day mm -hmm. and then blending them into one so you get this sort of mixed light effect that you wouldn't be able to get under a single exposure yeah you can use some of that to your effect creatively well thank you i'm going to try that you're welcome. No problem. My pleasure. Are you doing your own printing or are you sending it out? It depends. I do a lot of printing at home now if it's um, um, Z clay prints, um, but I also sell a lot of uh, metallic metal prints and, and acryl or, uh, acrylic prints, which I can't do at home. So those get sent out to a lab. But I do do a lot of printing on my um, my P800 and P900 here at, at home. I love printing at home. I think it's important to print as a photographer um, because there are certain things, <laughs> certain imperfections that you don't see when you just, when you prepare just for a web posting on like Facebook or Instagram or whatever. When you print something, even if you print it only up to, you know, 13 by 19 or 12 by 18, you'll see all those little imperfections and and, and it really helps you to sort of refine your, your process in the digital darkroom, I think, when you do your own printing. So I do like to do a lot of printing on my own at home, yeah. I mean, here's one that I just, I've just printed this um, from like a few, you know, so I just, I do, I do like nice, like Zeekly prints at home. But this is, a, I use a lot of the Hamamule photo rag paper to do it on. It looks nice, you know, and I, I can do a lot of my soft proofing and printing right here at the house. And then um, if I need something really big or something specific like an acrylic face mount or uh, even like a print to, to metal, I send out to labs for that. What kind of printer are you using? Uh, Epson printers and I Epson. use the, the 800 and the 900. Okay. You call that some type of Z print? Uh, Z, uh, Z clay, G clay. So it's just inkjet prints, you know, basically I'm using, mostly I use Moab or um, Hamamule papers for a lot, most of my printing, um, sort of like the, um, the rag papers I like quite a bit. Some of the, some of the textured stuff the, for some of the more um, abstract images that have a lot of natural texture in the photograph themselves. I'll use like sort of a, a heavier cotton-based texture paper um, for the general landscape stuff. I like to print them on like a smoother, like semi gloss paper look really nice that's using uh pigment pigment yep correct good discussion who else has a question So I take it you're happy with the P900, 9000 is it a new one? Yeah, the, I have the 900. So I can do about 17 inches wide with that. I can do longer prints if I use roll paper. So for doing pano stuff, I can do pretty, pretty good size wall prints. But I can do, you know, really, really lovely like 16 by 24s with roll paper off that printer. It looks, they look amazing. Very sharp, very good detail, good color depth. Um, you know, they look uh, very impressive. I, I love printing with it. Yeah, I've sold a lot of those. Clients love those prints. They they have a lot of um, really good dynamic range, really good depth. If you use a good paper, like a heavy paper, I use the the Hamamule stuff is like 
390 grams or whatever. It's, it's pretty thick paper. So it's got a good feeling to it, even when you hold it, you know, and send it to a buyer, even before they put it behind a frame, hopefully, or whatever. It's just got a really nice feel. It doesn't feel thin or flimsy. It's a beautiful paper. Yeah. So, great. All right. All right. All right. Going once. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Going thank twice. You too. Thank, thank you. God for, thank God for Zoom. <laughs> really? no, I, will, I will say I did take a class with Joseph in 2009 on HDR. Oh, yeah. Was that down in St. Saint, uh, Saint Michael's? Annapolis. Annapolis. Was, Karen was on that. Well, you probably don't. Yeah, I, that was God. That feels like a lifetime ago now. <laughs> it helped a lot. Good. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Thank you, Fred. Hell, January feels like a lifetime ago. Yeah, you're right, doesn't it? I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I feel like I aged 20 years this year. <laughs> yes. All right, Joseph. Appreciate you coming out and sharing your ideas with us tonight. And uh, I think we're going to go ahead and, and call it a meeting. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Joseph. Thank so much. Thank Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks See you guys. Take it easy. Bye. 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 Bye.